the process worked and how the winners were chosen. Uh, each year, early in the year, the Center Prize competition is announced on all of the sponsors' websites, uh, on social media, and it is circulated through various networks and coalitions that focus on illicit flows and anti-money laundering and anti-corruption efforts. So we try to make as many efforts as possible to get as wide distribution of the announcement as we possibly can. Uh, once uh, uh, submissions are made, papers uh, are, are sent in to us, uh, they are received as blind submissions, meaning that the reviewers, and this year we had five, uh, do, do not know the gender, the nationality, or the educational or professional background of any of the authors. Uh, and then the papers are randomly assigned to the reviewers. We had 18 papers this year. And each reviewer then recommends one or two uh, of the papers in their group for advancement to the next review round. Uh, at that point, all the reviewers read all the remaining papers and then the list was reduced to six finalists. And then from there, the winners, the winner and the runners up uh, were selected. So that's a brief overview of how we, how we ran the competition and how we've been running the competition since the, since the beginning. With that, let me start the program. I want to take the opportunity uh, to, do we have Mr. O'Kenny with us? I don't know if he's been able to join us or not. I don't believe so. Um, let me see. Apparently not. Uh, so we will go to the, um, the runners up. Uh, this year was a bit uh, uh, a different uh, uh, process. Uh, usually we have one winner, one second prize winner. Um, this year, the papers we received were overall of very high quality, and I think the competition was probably the most intense we've had in the history of the prize. Um, it was just an excellent set of papers, and for that reason, uh, we broke with our normal tradition. Instead of one second prize award, we're awarding three. They're, they were that close. Uh, and we thought all three were deserving of a prize. And so we're gonna hear from all three second prize winners as well. Uh, the first of those goes to Roy Cullen, uh, whose paper titled Pulling the Plug on Money Laundering in British Columbia, Lessons Learned and Actions Required. A bit of background on uh, Mr. Cullen. He was elected to the Canadian House of Commons in 1996 and served in that role until his retirement in 2008. And throughout his career, he developed an extensive experience in good governance, anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, and public sector financial management. Uh, and this range of experience is quite evident in his paper, in which he thoroughly highlights the, roles, uh, the role casinos, real estate, and other financial transactions play in money laundering. And he makes the point that money laundering is not a victimless crime at all, uh, and argues that more government effort is needed to address this growing problem. So I want to offer our congratulations to Roy. Uh, Roy, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, greetings to all. Boa tarde. Um, I'd like to share my screen, if possible, with my PowerPoint. Can we try that now? I'm just going to... Um... <clears throat> Okay, that seemed to work. I'm just gonna take it back to the start here, if I can. Um, okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Amartya Sen for his distinguished public service. It was, uh, I was looking forward to uh, seeing him virtually, and, but uh, that couldn't be helped. But uh, I'd like to thank him also for supporting uh, this essay contest. Thanks also to Global Financial Integrity, Academic Stand Against Poverty, and the Yale University's Global Justice Program for sponsoring uh, this initiative. Now, uh, how big is the problem? Well, uh, it's big by most standards. Uh, it, in tw the year 2000, Canada 
introduced legislation and passed legislation uh, setting up the anti-money laundering regime in Canada. We were the last G7 country to do so. And the bill was entitled the Proceeds of Crime Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act. And that established Canada's Financial Intelligent Unit or FIU. And it was is called the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Center of Canada or FinTrack as it's more affectionately referred to as. Uh, things were going along relatively smoothly. The, uh, the anti-money laundering regime was uh, benchmarked against many other jurisdictions. We had a lot of experience to draw on. We believed at the time that uh, the government believed at the time that it was properly mandated and resourced. And uh, so things were going on along relatively smoothly until the year 2015 when Canadians were shocked seeing images of duffel bags loaded with cash, $20 bills wrapped in uh, rubber bands entering British Columbia casinos. And um, the, uh, the government was very concerned about this. And so they called upon a retired a former deputy commissioner of the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Dr. Peter German, uh, to uh, review the all aspects of this and report back to the government. And he did, and he did a very comprehensive review and came out with a, uh, a long report, a comprehensive report and 48 recommendations. Uh, leading up to this, though, I should say by way of background, in 2016, the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, uh, asked the IMF to review Canada's uh, anti-money laundering regime. And in their report, they were generally positive, but they identified one significant problem, and that was the fact that lawyers were not required to report suspicious transactions. I should say in the year 2000, when Canada's anti-money laundering regime was established, lawyers were included as reporting entities. But this was challenged by lawyers in Canada, and a Supreme Court decision in 2015 uh, determined that lawyers need not report suspicious transactions on the basis of solicitor client privilege. Now, where's all this dirty money coming from? Well, of course we have our, the usual players, the uh, uh, drug money, uh, drug dealers, uh, transnational crime syndicates, kleptocrats, corrupt individuals, and because of the geopolitics between uh, British Columbia and uh, the People's Republic of China and Hong Kong, there is a lot of interaction between the two entities. And by way of example, it's estimated in the year uh, 2036, 20.8% of, of the people in Vancouver will be of Chinese descent. Another a metric, uh, the foreign direct investment from the People's Republic of China to Canada grew on average 19% annually from 2007 to 2017. Uh, so with, with those connections, money launders, of course, go to the places where they can get away with it. And what happened, and I'll come back to this in more detail later, the uh, enforcement of the anti-money laundering provisions were weakened, they weren't enforced. And so the money launderers started to move into BC in a very big way. And the growth was geometric and the floodgates opened. Um, professor John Langdale, a professor in Australia, came up with the term, unfortunately for uh, British Columbia, the Vancouver model, which uh, basically described how various players helped uh, people in the People's Republic of China get, get past the exchange control restrictions there by various means, uh, get the money into Vancouver and through various means and, and methods, launder that money through uh, BC casinos, real estate, and through companies and trusts in, in the province of British Columbia. The, um, the casinos uh, very much was established early on that there was very much a, a bias that, you know, the money could be clean. And so the bias towards clean money, and I think it went right up to the top of the BC government who were briefed on some of the problems. But I think uh, what happened was they saw it, whether it was dirty or clean money, it was still generating revenue through the the state-owned enterprise, BC Lotteries Corporation, which has the overall responsibility for managing and the oversight of, of gaming in British Columbia. The other uh, branch of the BC government is the uh, Gaming Policy and Enforcement Branch, which is charged with regulating gaming in British Columbia. So the drugs started to move very quickly in, in and around uh, British Columbia, fentanyl, 
from China and other sources, fentanyl made locally. And um, the, uh, the problem just began to uh, exacerbate and uh, grow as it, as it went along. So the, uh, Dr. Peter German's report um, uh, contained uh, 48 recommendations. And one of my recommendations is that the BC government implement all 48. They're very solid recommendations. I'll talk a bit about some of the primary ones in a bit later, uh, but the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, BC government has indicated that they will implement all the recommendations. And the Minister of Finance has said that the resources will be made available to do so because some of them will require resources. The other recommendation I made was that a way has to be found to include lawyers as reporting entities um, in, in the money laundering regime. And there are some ways to do that that I discuss uh, in my essay. Now, real estate, this is, a, this is where a lot of the dirty money ended up um, in, a, in a very big way. Uh, in 2018, it's estimated that $5 billion was laundered through real estate in British Columbia. And uh, the opioid crisis uh, began in earnest. And in 2016, 931 uh, deaths were attributed to opioids. Um, as I said, because of the, uh, the lax enforcement, the money launderers started to move in in great number. Uh, real estate agents, it appears that they, they are not reporting or underreporting certain sales. Efforts to know your customer are minimal as are the associated due diligence measures that are required. To avoid questions from a financial institutions, uh, deposits are staggered or combined and many other ways of, of trying to circumvent the system. Um, the, um, there's insufficient training also of real estate agents in British Columbia, but the British Columbia government has announced its intention to create a new regulator for British Columbia's real estate sector by 2021. In parallel with this move, the Real Estate Council of BC is launching a mandatory anti-money laundering course for BC real estate agents and property managers. This is needed, a needed and positive step. So on this slide, you'll see the highlights of some of Dr. Peter German's recommendations to set up a new regulator, to define clearly what the roles and responsibilities are between the regulator and the BC Lottery Corporation, to have suspicious transactions reported directly from the gaming service providers, the casinos, straight to FinTrack, the Financial Intelligence Unit. At this point, they, at that point, I should say they weren't. They were going to the BC Lottery Corporation and they were vetting some of the suspicious transactions and sending um, some of them onwards to the FinTrack. So that um, uh, those, uh, the other recommendations are that, um, that a designated policing unit be set up to police uh, gaming in British Columbia. And uh, we had a ridiculous situation where regulators were at casinos nine to five, Monday to Friday. So it's not surprising that money launders uh, uh, showed up uh, on the weekends and at, at, at nighttime. Um, so just continuing on in that vein, um, <clears throat> we do know that money launderers are use very sophisticated techniques, layering companies uh, using shell companies, nominee directors, nominee shareholders, et cetera. And uh, what is needed is a, uh, a beneficial ownership uh, registry, preferably a public one, but uh, uh, certainly a transparent as, as, as one can get it. Uh, it's also noted in Canada in a study that was conducted uh, by Margaret Beer and Stephen Schneider that uh, a, a vast majority of the money laundering in Canada does go through real estate. So this is an area that has to be uh, uh, dealt with. Global Witness, which is a non-governmental organization in a 2018 report, however, uh, in a report entitled The Companies We Keep, noted that thousands of United UK companies are filing highly suspicious entries or not complying with the rules that were established in 2016 when the UK government was the first uh, government to set up a public uh, beneficial ownership registry. Uh, people are just not complying, they're making false uh, entries. And so that my view and one of my recommendations is that a, a transparent and accountable beneficial ownership registry for all BC companies and trusts beyond just real estate interests, which the government has taken steps now to bring into play, 
but it has to extend beyond real estate and it has to include BC, all BC companies and trusts. And there needs to be due diligence of the, of the declarations. That requires resourcing, independent resourcing, and there have to be some accountability. So if false declarations are made, there, can be, there will be sanctions, including freezing of assets and potentially confiscation of assets. It's inherently a conflict of interest with financial intermediaries. Uh, to, they're posed with this problem. Someone wants to invest, give them some deposits, buy some real estate, and for these people to tell people that uh, their customers that they need to report these as suspicious transactions is a bit of a, a belief, and but it has to be done, and it has to be, it has to be audited. Now, what are the costs? The costs of an impacts of money laundering are huge. There's a general a corrupting influence on society. Uh, money laundering facilitates criminal activity, and it destabilizes financial markets. Uh, it's also noted uh, that a five, that the money laundering in British Columbia resulted in a five percent increase in housing prices which negatively impacts, of course, housing affordability and also homelessness. In fact, in a 2017 research report by Zillow Research, it was noted that in, in a city like Seattle, for example, a 5% increase in housing prices would add 258 people to the homeless population. In New York City, a, an equal 5% increase would lead to nearly 3,000 more people falling into homelessness. Of course, the opioid crisis um, there are the human costs of, of people dying, people as lives being negatively affected significantly, very difficult to put a, a, a value on that, but there are also associated fiscal costs. In fact, very recently, the BC government filed a $9.1 billion lawsuit to recover public health costs associated with the opioid crisis. And they're suing about 40 uh, uh, pharmaceutical firms and distributors, uh, makers of OxyContin, now the nine billion may be overstated and it still has to be proven in court, but there must be some validity to that number. So the, the cost um, is, is enormous. <clears throat> it's not a problem just limited though to BC or Canada. Recently, New York's financial regulator said that, and I quote, banks and governments have allowed money laundering to metastasize inside the banking system and they reveal sweeping failures by global banks to stop the illicit financial flows. So it's a BC problem, it's a Canada problem, it's a world problem that we need to uh, deal with. Now the federal government has a uh, large responsibilities in the area of, of, of combating money laundering. Uh, first of all is the Financial Intelligence Unit, FinTrack, which is housed uh, within for oversight, the Ministry of Finance. Another recommendation that I have is to leave it in finance it's meant to be an intelligence gathering uh, institution that feeds information in certain ways to law enforcement or the intelligence services in Canada. Uh, but these are the major players. Also the uh, Department of Justice is responsible for enacting or bringing forward criminal law to parliament for passage and debate. Now that there's strong evidence to suggest that FinTrack is not effective in auditing reporting entities there is a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence in particular with respect to uh, luxury cars, casinos, uh, real estate that, um, that uh, leads people to believe with some jurist, uh, justification that these uh, reporting entities are not being sufficiently monitored. Also, uh, something happened that shouldn't have, in my judgment, the RCMP uh, in Division E, which covers uh, British Columbia and Alberta and Canada, they used to have a proceeds of crime unit, which would take information received from the financial intelligence unit, FinTrack, and decide whether or not they would corroborate that with information they had and perhaps investigate and ultimately press charges. So that um, uh, that needs to be reinstated, which is another one of my recommendations. And uh, as I said, FinTrack needs to do a better job of monitoring the reporting, reporting entities. The other big problem is that money launderers are not being effectively prosecuted in British Columbia and indeed across Canada. Uh, from 20, 2000 to 2016 in Canada, 321 guilty verdicts only in money laundering cases were made. And that's much lower than the USA and the UK. There are a number of reasons for that. 
A shortage of law enforcement and prosecutorial resources could be one of them. I'm sure it is one of them. Uh, law enforcement generally are more comfortable laying charges on the predicate offense, the drug dealer. Um, it's uh, Money laundering is a little more difficult to pin down. And I think law enforcement is more comfortable uh, not doing it. And uh, there also is an erroneous view out there that the predicate offense must be identified. But the Criminal Code of Canada is quite explicit in stating that charges for money laundering offenses may be laid notwithstanding the absence of charges relating to a predicate offense. You only need proof that the money launderer knew or believed that the funds came from illegal activities. And this, this position is consistent with the Financial Action Task Force, which is the international standard setter uh, in money laundering. So I'm recommending on the screen that the Attorney General for Canada uh, and the Attorney General in, in the provinces uh, mount training and education programs for federal and provincial Crown prosecutors and law enforcement agencies to encourage the laying of charges for money laundering offenses and debunk the theory that they need to go after the predicate offense. You need to go after that as well. Now, lessons learned. I think there are quite a few lessons that might be of use to other jurisdictions. First of all, when problems in, with money laundering are detected, uh, the government or the regulatory authorities or all stakeholders need to move quickly and make uh, take decisive action. Uh, secondly, continuous improvement applies to the anti-money laundering regime as it does to any other system. What worked before may not work today. Any money laundering uh, system has to include the, the essential building blocks, including legislation, regulations, and guidelines, and an appropriately mandated and resourced financial intelligence unit with thoroughly trained and motivated staff. The weakest link, as I said earlier, money launderers, it's no secret. They go to where the weakest link is. And in British Columbia, the lack of enforcement and the lack of resources uh, was a strong signal to money launderers. And they ended up uh, laundering a lot of dirty money in this province. Reporting entities, those that have to report suspicious transactions, they need to be broadly defined and they need to be monitored by the financial intelligence unit to ensure that they are reporting the suspicious transactions that they're meant to be. The, um, the tip of the iceberg, what I mean by this is that money laundering in casinos is often the tip of the iceberg and symptomatic of deeper problems with dirty money. I think this is what happened in British Columbia. Casinos were a problem, but uh, I think the deeper problems are within the real estate and corporate and other sectors. This, the cost to society of money laundering are huge, as I described earlier. Uh, the lack of an effective money laundering deterrent can lead and has led to a spike in British Columbia in transnational criminality, including drug trafficking, opioid addiction, and lost and altered lives, not to mention the pressures on social service and healthcare services and costs. And the loss of confidence in the integrity of financial systems discourages illegal, uh, sorry, legitimate investment. Money laundering, as I pointed out in the real estate sector, negatively affects housing affordability. We need transparent and accountable beneficial ownership registries, hopefully public, available to the public, but you need to have um, due diligence, properly resourced and funded independently, and there needs to be sanctions or consequences if false declarations are made. Prosecute, prosecute, prosecute. We need to prosecute money launderers and that will send the message that uh, and act as a deterrent to criminal activities. And finally, relationships and communication. The jurisdictions, when they find that there are some money laundering issues, they need to be communicating with the general public, all stakeholders, they need to be taking action. They need to be forthright and honest with the public about what's going on. And they also need to work with other agencies uh, on other financial intelligence units using the resources, for example, of the Egmont Group, which is the, the international anti-money laundering organization. And so it needs communication and integration and information sharing. And those are the key elements to making the anti-money laundering regime a success. So with that, I will end and um, I wanna thank you for your attention. I look forward to any comments uh, in due course. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Roy. That was a very interesting presentation. I appreciate it. Um, 
several similarities between challenges in Canada and US, of course, the use of real estate and anonymous shell companies to launder funds and the need for beneficial ownership registry. As you probably know, there's legislation in the US Congress now that would create a registry. Uh, unfortunately, not a public one, but still something that law enforcement and the IRS can, um, can use to address these problems that we see in so, so many countries. So thank you again very much for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, the next uh, awardee of the second prize goes to Philip Matteo of Transparency International in Kenya. Uh, Mr. Matteo holds an honors law degree from the University of West London and a master's in human rights law from the London Metropolitan University. Uh, and among his many accomplishments in promoting good governance and financial transparency, he has led successful advocacy campaigns in Kenya and Tanzania, promoting regulations to establish what Roy was just talking about, beneficial ownership registries for companies. Uh, Mr. Matteo's very well-documented paper, uh, for which he was awarded second, play, uh, second prize, was titled Illicit Financial Flows in the Extractive Sector on the African Continent, Impacts, Enabling Factors, and Proposed Reform Measures. Uh, in the paper, uh, Mr. Matteo summarizes the adverse economic, political, and environmental impacts of illicit flows in the extractive sector and makes several recommendations to strengthen the legal and regulatory framework within the, with the aim of increasing domestic resource mobilization. Uh, congratulations to Philip, and we look forward to your remarks. Uh, just trying to share my uh, my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Candoni. I, I want to thank you and GFI, uh, Yale University Global Justice Program, and uh, Professor Amatya Sen for this for this award and for having this program and for supporting the course towards uh, dealing with the issues of uh, illicit financial flows. Um, uh, my my. My presentation covers an overview of uh, IFFs in the context of the African extractive sector, the social uh, factors which perpetuate uh, IFFs in this context, and the measures to curtail those IFFs. Uh, my, my, my paper also summarizes the adverse economic, political, and environmental impacts and identifies um, gaps in current legislation and policy, including the weaknesses in national tax system. I proposed specific actions to strengthen effectiveness of current legal and regulatory measures, achieve uh, policy coherence, and increase domestic resource mobilization. And I just start with the definition. I think it's important that uh, the IFF definition, the illicit financial de flows definition is debatable, but the normative interpretation is that uh, it is capital taken abroad in a hidden form perhaps because it is illegal or perhaps because it goes against the social norms or because it might be vulnerable to economic or political threat. Uh, they can be defined as money illicitly and transfer, transferred or utilized, including through corruption, money laundering and tax evasion, which is a very common feature in the African mining sector. The term is uh, flexible enough to accommodate strictly legal aspect and and practices that go beyond established norms, including tax avoidance. In this presentation, I've used the term illicit financial flows and is intended to encompass any or all of the activities noted in the definitions uh, uh, above. Uh, above. Uh, and, and here is how Africa loses to uh, illicit financial flows. And this is due to lack of financial transparency, which gives rise to IFFs. And these outflows happen through a laundering of criminal proceeds through drug trafficking, uh, human trafficking, corruption through bribery of officials, theft of state assets and uh, transferred abroad, 
tax abuse, both corporate and individual, market abuse, conflict of interest and regulatory frame uh, abuse, which uh, leads to funds coming up from criminal origin, funds with a criminal destination, sometimes for terrorism financing or conflict financing, funds associated with tax evasion, transfers to or by for entity to subject to financial sanctions, and transfers which seek to evade anti-money laundering and countering of financing of uh, terrorism financing measures and other legal requirements such as transparency and uh, capital controls. Um, in this case, I think regarding how our Africa loses, we need to look at uh, the key point that is that retaining illicit financial flows would help alleviate Africa's um, ongoing infrastructure, education, health and agriculture deficit. And so I recommended that Africa needs to develop its capacity to fill the gaps that allow IFFs to cripple the continent. And now I look at the impacts of the illicit financial flows on the mining sector in Africa. The economic uh, ones include uh, what the GFI, the Global Financial Integrity, estimated that in 2013, developing countries, all 54 African countries included, lost uh, an estimated 1.1 trillion through illicit financial flows. And this was noted to be highly conservative because it overlooked the issue of mispricing of services and other types of money laundering. And according to GFI, about 45% of illicit financial flows ended up not in Africa, but outside Africa in offshore financial centers and developed countries. And so the interconnectedness of IFFs from developing to developed countries where most of the stolen funds and assets are hidden shows why this is a global problem that requires collective global efforts and the measures uh, that are combined with these uh, efforts of uh, Amartya Sen Award and GFI and uh, Global uh, Program of Yale and other, and other stakeholders. So the promotion of a strong international architecture that is ready to combat and fully em eliminate the problem is therefore prime important. And, and, and looking at how serious the problem is, it is estimated by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa that Africa loses 50 billion in illicit financial flows. And that report said that amount could help the continent more than meet its infrastructure needs, which is a binding constraint to economic growth. So actually Africa has no, has no other choice but to look forward, making every effort to plug illicit financial flows loopholes as aid is now dwindling and becoming relatively marginal for meeting the 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, according to the recent Mo Ibrahim uh, Index of African Governance in 2019, Public management as an aggregate score increased by 1.5% over the first five years. This program, this progress, however, masks the damaging institutional impact of illicit financial flows. African countries, African economies bearing a disproportionate brand with the highest illicit financial flows to GDP ratio at 5.7%. And this illicit financial practices have grown from three grew from 3.5. 9% in 2002 to about 7% in 2011. Like a vicious circle, the, the, the report says, financial flows erode the tax base of most African countries and in turn, weaken the, the physical base further, which ac accelerates illicit uh, practices. Uh, the political uh, impact have been a weak correlation between levels of illicit financial flows and common governance um, barometers, including the fragile states and corruption perception indexes, as well as the World Bank's institutional assessment. And then the other issue that is critical for Africa is the, 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 the concept of the paradox of plenty. The great mineral wealth, which exists side by side with pervasive poverty, remains the biggest challenge to achieving development. And it can be seen that over 80% of the mineral rich countries in Africa associated with high level financial flows and are performed in the areas of rule of law, effectiveness, and that was according, and also according to the National Natural Resource Governance Index, an accountability and tool for the mining sector. Over 50% of those of the worst performing countries in that uh, tool were African. Environmental 
uh, impacts have been that the boom in extractives and exploitation of natural resources in Africa poses major risks of environmental degradation and a source of corrupt practices leading to lack of transparency, hence the increase in illicit financial flows. The criminal component of illicit financial practices also results in widespread and systematic degradation of the environment. And while it is difficult to establish clear causation, it is reasonable to assume that the hunter pricing of African minerals will accelerate their depletion and that report, under reporting of the timber exports of Africa from a country, for example, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, accelerates the deforestation of one of the world's critical ecosystems. Abusive transfer mispricing of underpriced the environment cost of mine closures, leaving the state to assume the, the liability with a lasting impact on the population's health, safety, and welfare. Uh, the gaps and the unintended consequences of legislation and policy on IFFs has been legislation has been diverted or interpreted in a way that allows mining companies or governments to continue to perpetuate illicit financial flows as highlighted by recent scandals that tarnished the sector. And playing with the rules of the game has made it possible, not only through the support of intermediaries, but also the availability of legal tools. So illicit financial flows within the extractive industry sector offers a glance of how legal requirements can be manipulated and diverted. Most countries lack a whole of government policy consistency framework. And while there is increasing awareness of multinational companies tax avoidance practices in the sector, there are no comprehensive working definition of illicit financial flows exist in any of, of the mineral regimes. A beneficial ownership disclosure in the extractive sector has become a path fraught with pitfalls. And why is it important? Disclosing beneficial ownership is a great deterrence to illicit financial flows because complex corporate structures have enabled public, both public and directly who, or indirectly, ultimately who owns a company which may contribute to concealing suspicious activities. Therefore, transparency of beneficial ownership makes it possible to determine whether a company is closely linked to politically exposed persons. And according to the extractive industry, a beneficial owner means the natural person or persons who directly or indirectly ultimately owns or controls the corporate entity. So a beneficial owner is never a corporation but always an individual. Local content requirements has become an avenue for perpetuating corruption. Whilst the objectives of the local content requirements policies are to create jobs, promote enterprise, accelerate the transfer of skills and technologies at national uh, uh, and that a country as a whole benefits from extractive activities, local content uh, policies can take various forms. They can be quantitative, that is when targets or quotas are set to be achieved by companies and or qualitative, that is when they require technology transfer and training of staff, etc. Although these policies were designed to shape and strengthen economic development, they have been misused and manipulated to generate corruption, elite capture and rent seeking in various instances. When looked at in detail, it is striking to see how these rules could be diverted to perpetuate illicit financial flaws. Lack of policy and legislative reform, uh, reform has, be, has created a loophole along the entire mining value chain. The scope and effectiveness of policy and legislative framework from country to, varies from country to country. United Nations Economic Commission's case study of countries showed some sort of legislation in place to curb transfer mispricing, and many have yet to formulate specific complementary regulatory guidance documents. Excessive leveraging by mining companies is a major source of domestic base erosion. The anti avoidance measures adopted are weak and contain the seeds of their own destruction. Since accrued interest from debt is deductible against tax liability, there is a strong tendency for mining companies to borrow internally from their affiliates rather than raise capital through the sale of shares. Tensions between national and international uh, systems, the scope and detail of the system of global standards are relevant to constraints on the scope countries must take 
to make individual decision, but African countries often, for African countries, this often leads to lack of reciprocal international cooperation. Countries that do participate in the global framework to combat illicit financial flows have significant restraints on their discretion. Some standard setting bodies evaluate compliance, implementation and effectiveness through peer review processes to check whether the standards are adequately applied. For example, the Financial uh, Action Task Force uh, system of uh, mutual evaluation reviews. There is a wide policy gap between the mandatory universal global standards and their implementation in the unique context of each country. Because no global standards can specify in detail how, how every country should implement each requirement, the individual countries must adapt the requirements to a form compatible with their administrative systems and policy objectives. Measures to combat illicit financial flows include strengthening legal and policy frameworks to promote transparency and mobilize domestic resources, requirement for jurisdiction to make disclosure mandatory, beneficial ownership registers, and to remove thresholds of, of ownership, reform local content requirements, breach to avoid perpetuation of uh, corruption, reform tax system and revenue transparency, improving tax compliance and strengthening data integration, and building investigative capacities to tackle economic crime in the African countries, countries is vital. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Philip, very much for that um, very interesting presentation. Um, uh, the paradox of plenty continues to be a challenge for the whole African region. Um, and uh, as uh, Roy before you was talking about the need for beneficial ownership registries, very simple transparency measures um, uh, can go a long way in helping governments address this problem of illicit flows and money laundering. So we see similarities across regions and across countries. Uh, and I think it's, it's uh, these types of, uh, you know, the, this echoing of the need for these types of registries that are going to push governments to eventually implement them. So again, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, our, our next, our third, uh, uh, second uh, place award goes to uh, Brian Collins Ochin. Uh, Mr. Ochin is currently pursuing his undergraduate Bachelor of Laws degree from McCary University in Kampala. Uh, and during his studies, he has cultivated an interest in international and cross-border issues. And most recently, during an internship last year at the Tax Appeals Tribunal in Kampala, he became aware of the magnitude of harmful and illegal tax avoidance occurring in Uganda by international companies. Uh, it was from those experiences he came to write his second place paper, which was titled, When Hunters Learn to Shoot Without Missing, the birds learn to fly without perching. Uh, Mr. Ochen's essay examines the phenomenon of artificial profit shifting by oil, oil companies and how these contribute to illicit financial flows. He argues that anti-abuse tax laws are required to address the problem, as is judicial support in upholding those laws. So I will turn it now to Brian. Congratulations on your second place award. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tom Kadamon. Uh, thank you, GFI. Uh, thank you. I was really uh, humbled and honored uh, to be a part of this. And I would just like by saying, start by saying that um, I am reminded of the story of the man who took his mule to the Kentucky Derby. And uh, he was asked if he expected his mule to win. Well, he said no but look at the company that my mule will be in. So I feel uh, really honored and humbled to be a part of this. Uh, so indeed my paper was on um, artificial profit shifting as the component of illicit financial flaws. Uh, and particularly my paper took for its province, uh, Uganda's upstream oil sector and for its purpose to drum out the sort of lawlessness that uh, Raymond Baker has said and noted has permeated the global commercial and financial affairs far more extensively than is commonly perceived. 
So what is artificial profit shifting? Under the current international taxation system, uh, multinational corporations can often reduce their global tax liabilities through profit shifting activities. But the OECD has noted that when it comes to arrangements that achieve no or low taxation by shifting profits away from the jurisdictions where the activities creating those profits take place, no or low taxation is not per se the cause of concern, but it becomes so when it is associated with practices that artificially segregate that income from the activities that generate it. And the background to artificial profit shifting is really a delicate balance between the legitimate individual rights of the taxpayer and the abuse of those individual rights by the taxpayer. How so? The principle that tax is a creature of statute uh, is a requirement of legal certainty that enables the function of the rule of law whose purpose is to guard against the arbitrary abuse of power. Uh, basically, the equity principle means that a tax claim by a tax authority will be justified if the state's claim on that income is based on a set of legal principles and not something that is abstract. But that's just one end of the coin. Equity is also justified on the basis of the benefits approach and the ability to pay approach. And according to the benefits approach, each taxpayer should contribute to tax revenues in line with the benefits she or he receives from public services. On the other hand, the ability to pay approach takes the view that the government needs to raise a certain sum of money and each individual should contribute in line with their ability to pay. Therefore, a tax liability is once a tax liability is prescribed under statute, a taxpayer may not pay less than what is required by the statute, except where a, an exemption prescribed so. So how does tax planning become a problem? Tax planning inevitably reaches a point beyond which it cannot be tolerated within the legal system if it is intended that the system be just. Uh, accordingly, the use of the corporate entity in tax planning is legally valid, provided its use is within the contours of the law. Uh, and that's why we see that the misuse of rights is a legal concept that has now been developed. Um, it is a limited principle, at least in corporate affairs, that permits the piercing of the corporate veil in cases of misuse, fraud, malfeasance, or evasion of legal obligation. Uh, so tax law has also seen the development of the doctrine of abuse of tax laws to distinguish permissible from impermissible tax avoidance. Uh, therefore, uh, tax avoidance is not illegal per se, which means that there are circumstances in which it can be illegal. And let's look at one of the circumstances. From 2006 onward, um, a series of oil discoveries put Uganda on the global energy map, owing to the discovery of 6.5 billion barrels of oil, of which 1.4 to about 1.7 billion were economically recoverable. And the World Bank described Uganda as the hottest inland exploration frontier to watch in the oil and gas sector. These were the largest onshore oil fields, finds rather, in the sub-Saharan Africa in over two decades. The upstream oil sector involves the search and recovery of crude oil and other hydrocarbons. Uh, this sector is quite sophisticated and involves a lot of resources. 
The exploration process, for instance, involves geological, geophysical, and geochemical analysis with sophisticated software technologies, such as advanced 3D seismic sampling, and so on and so forth. So the upstream sector inevitably requires that poorer countries that own these resources partner with international oil companies to carry out the operations. With the involvement of the international oil companies, a fiscal arrangement is needed. A fiscal regime or arrangement is a set of instruments or tools that determine how revenues from oil and mining projects are shared between the host state and the oil companies. Uganda for its part operates what is known as the contractual petroleum fiscal arrangement, the production sharing agreement. Under this contractual arrangement, the government remains the owner of the oil and gas resources and awards the international oil company with a license to exploit the oil and gas. The contractor then is compensated in kind through cost oil, to, which is a portion of the crude oil to cater for the expenses that have been incurred by the international oil company. Uh, the, the balance of that, which is the profit oil, is then split between the government and the international oil company. Uh, the profit oil apportionment of the international oil company is still subject to a corporate income tax assessment. And for Uganda's case, it is at a 30% rate. So what is source taxation? Here is where source taxation rates of governments that host non-resident companies come into play. Foreign companies with significant activities in a country are typically only taxed on the income from sources within that country. This is a concept of source taxation which must be distinguished from resident taxation. A source country's jurisdiction to tax foreign persons is limited to the income and within the source country's borders. Source jurisdictions provide significant benefits to corporations, and this justifies source-based taxation. Such benefits include the provision of infrastructure or education, as well as more specific government policies, such as uh, keeping the exchange rate stable and low interest rates. These benefits justify source-based taxation in the sense that the host country's government bears some of the costs of providing benefits that are necessary for earning the income. For multinational corporations, whereas their ability to operate in several jurisdictions presents exposure to the taxing rights of more than one country, it also pre presents even more opportunities for tax planning. Such tax such a tax planning toolkit uh, will involve the avoidance of taxable presence in relation to activities performed by intermediate subsidiaries in a source country. It will involve reducing tax base in high tax jurisdiction source countries by means of deductible payments. It will also involve striving for non-current taxation of law tax profits at the level of the parent company. And finally, it will involve the use of hybrid mismatch arrangements that provide particular benefits in reducing the tax level at intermediate subsidiaries. Back to Uganda's case. Um, in 1997, uh, a production sharing agreement was concluded by the government of Uganda and Heritage Oil and Gas. At the interests of Heritage upon the discovery of commercially viable oil uh, were eventually sold to Talo. The sale by heritage to Talo resulted in an income tax assessment of 400 million US dollars. Uh, this, just to note, is uh, way more than Uganda's health budget. Uh, 
uh, and um, and so we are talking about great sums here. Now, a critical analysis of the events that followed and the protracted legal disputes that ensued between Heritage and the government uh, led to the conclusion that Heritage was in extensive use of artificial profit shifting mechanisms to avoid capital gains tax. These mechanisms included chiefly the use of sham transactions without substance. Uh, Heritage was incorporated in the Bahamas and later re-registered in Mauritius in 2010 with no commercial activity in Mauritius. This redomiciling of Heritage happened only 10 days before the sale of its interests to Talo. Uh, further revelations from the Panama Papers contained emails written by an accountant acting on behalf of Heritage, precisely stating that Heritage Oil and Gas was looking to redomicile to Mauritius to avoid capital gains tax due on the sale of its asset within the 11 days period. In addition, Heritage Oil also used the classic treaty abuse of the Uganda Mauritius double tax agreement. Uh, the case documents that were available uh, at the Tax Appeals Tribunal indicated that Mr. Paul Richard uh, Hefferton, the director of Heritage, had given false evidence to the Tax Appeals Tribunal that the change in registration uh, of Heritage to the Bahamas was not done for purposes of tax avoidance, when in fact, it had been done for the purposes of tax avoidance as was later discovered uh, in the High Court in the UK by Justice Bayton. Heritage also involved the use of artificial avoidance of permanent establishment by outsourcing its drilling activities to third parties and having no assets in Uganda artificially so as to avoid permanent establishment. Uh, these operations were actually done by affiliated companies in heritage names. So it's quite clear that the applicability of the relevant anti-abuse legislation in order to curb this phenomenon of artificial profit shifting, which is achieved through a host of mechanisms uh, is not enough. The domestic anti-abuse rules need to be supplemented with judicial doctrines that may be used to stop such transactions. These rules, we argue, have moved from the realm of law that is referred to as lex veranda, that is the law as it ought to be, and have moved to the realm of law that is referred as lex latter, that is the law as it is. Anti-avoidance rules are divided into two categories, those that are general and those that are specific. Um, the tax law with regard to specific anti-avoidance rules is designed to deal with particular transactions that can be uh, uh, targeted. A tax authority seeking to address the improper use of tax treaties may consider the application of specific anti-avoidance rules such as the limitation of benefits clauses, uh, the limitation on rules of interest deductibility, and so on and so forth. However, beyond that is the general anti-avoidance rules. The general anti-avoidance rule is intended to prevent abusive arrangements that are, adequate, that are not adequately dealt with through the specific anti-abuse rules and therefore, they are wider in scope. Uh, the GAR is a key mechanism. The GAR, that is the general anti-avoidance rule, is a key mechanism designed to limit artificial schemes that circumvent the tax, the tax statute's purpose, despite these schemes being in compliance with more specific uh, texts of the statute. And there are several countries all over the world that have already implemented this GAR. However, we note that the role of the judiciary is a critical role here. Now is the time 
for anti-avoidance doctrines and precedents. And these doctrines should not be at the expense of impartiality or independence. The judiciary must ensure that the distortion of equity principles is not achieved by taxpayers. Some countries have developed through their courts various anti-avoidance doctrines, such as the substance over form doctrine or the concept of abuse of law. These are essentially doctrines relating to interpretation of tax legislation. And while the interpretation of tax treaties is governed by general rules that have been codified, uh, judicial approaches to the interpretation of these rules is necessary to supplement these anti-avoidance rules. Now, what is the impact of the chronic recidivism of illicit financial flows via artificial profit shifting, specifically to the tax, uh, specifically rather, on the tax to GDP ratio of least developed countries such as Uganda. Generally, the impact of illicit financial flows on least developed countries such as Uganda is a lack of sustainable development characterized by the continued reliance on artificial, or rather, rather, on official development assistance, also known as aid or debt. Developing countries require sustainable sources of finance for development. And most countries will need to increase domestic tax revenues to gradually replace aid and debt as sources of finance for public goods and services. Since 2000, the highest tax to GDP ratio in Uganda was 13.5% in 2017 with the lowest being 10.4% in 2010. In 2018, Uganda's tax to GDP ratio was lower than the ratio in neighboring Kenya, which was 18%, and in neighboring Rwanda, which was 16%, and was below the broader COMESA and sub-Saharan averages. During his national address after the reading of this year's budget 2021, uh, the president of Uganda decried the low ratio of tax to GDP ratio in Uganda, which stands at 14.3%. And since 1997, this ratio has stagnated, only growing from 11% in 23 years. Having seen the effects of uh, artificial profit shifting uh, on developing and less developed countries such as Uganda, we argue that the mechanisms that are needed now is for judicial uh, approaches to tax legislation that will take into account uh, public interests and public rights, uh, well balanced with individual rights, but judges should uh, take an approach that prevents individual rights from being abused by, individual, uh, 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 by individuals, such as companies uh, and especially international oil companies that come to operate in uh, uh, least developed countries, such as Uganda. Um, again, I want to, to, to thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, I'm very grateful to Global Financial Integrity for this opportunity. Uh, back to you, Tom. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for those remarks. Um, you know, I, I want to note that one of the reviewers of your paper re referred to it as a well-sourced and well-written technical approach to profit shifting. So given that and given your, your second pr place award, I think you very much uh, belong with the other thoroughbreds at the Kentucky Derby. So uh, thank you again for your submission. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I don't believe our, our uh, first place uh, winner, Mr. Kenny, has joined us. Um, uh, but what I would like to do is at least introduce, uh, introduce him to the group, uh, if he's, even though he's not able to join us, uh, introduce his paper. Uh, and then I will uh, turn to Raymond Baker for uh, a couple of his comments. And I think we have a, a few minutes uh, remaining if anybody in the audience would like to 
ask a question or two of, of any of the um, any of the paper's authors. Um, but with that, I just want to note that uh, uh, Mr. Kenny is a Nigerian-born researcher uh, and a multiple award-winning essayist. Uh, and through his writing, he seeks to promote human rights by highlighting the abuses suffered by others. Uh, the title of his first place paper is A Stroke of the Keyboard and Click of the Mouse, An Anatomy of Cyber Frauds as a Growing Component of Illicit Financial Flows. And in the paper, he provides the very fascinating history and tactics and techniques of the so-called 419 email scams in Nigeria and examines the enabling factors behind the type of this type of crime and provides recommendations for legislative and judicial and financial reforms to, to address the problem. Um, one of the reviewers of his paper said that this is the best paper I have read in all the years of our Sen Prize submissions. It's superbly written, well edited, cogent, and convincing. And so certainly very high praise uh, and underscores uh, why he was awarded first place in this year's competition. So unfortunately, he's not able to join us, but uh, hearty congratulations to Mr. O'Kenny for his, his first place um, submission. Um, with that, I will turn it to uh, Raymond Baker, who would like to make a couple of comments. And I'm not hearing Raymond. I don't know if, uh, Raymond, I don't know if you're on uh, mute. I don't see him on the panel at all. Okay, I know he's, he's one of the participants. I know that, and I don't know if participants are able to make comments or not. Uh, Amanda, I know, was uh, trying to help Mr. O'Kenny. I don't know if she can help uh, Raymond or not. Yes, I'm trying to find him. And okay. I can find him as a participant. I I he I can I see him with his hand raised. Oh okay, okay, perfect. He's not allowed to talk. Okay, Raymond, am I vis Am I on? We can hear you. We can't see you. Don't know why you can't see me, but well, we hear uh, you loud and clear. Raymond, you're muted again. He's, he is now try uh, enter as a panelist. How about that? So then he can we can see him maybe. Okay, terrific. How about that? Can you hear me? We can hear you loud, loudly and clear. Okay. Um, let me add my congratulations to this year's uh, winners. I think we had the finest submission of papers that we've ever had in the years that we've been. Um, um, offering the SIN prize. Um, I would hope that that's not due to the pandemic, that is to say, due to people having more time to uh, devote, uh, but for whatever reason, um, we did have superb uh, submissions uh, this year. And congratulations to all the winners. To Mr. McKinney, who has not been able to um, um, join us, um, uh, I thought his paper was simply superb. As some of you know, I lived in Nigeria for um, uh, 15 years, uh, have kept up with the country um, uh, ever since then. Um, and I thought I knew something about the uh, 419 schemes um, and the cyber criminals, but uh, Mr. O'Kenny's paper was um, extraordinarily informative well-written and interesting. The, by far the finest analysis I've seen on, um, um, uh, on this issue. Um, Roy Cullen, great to uh, see you again. And I'm delighted to know that you are continuing to be active uh, in uh, this agenda. Thank you for your very thorough paper. Uh, British Columbia has long had a problem um, um, with money, uh, flowing from other countries, particularly into the real estate sector. 
um, uh, thank you for your thorough analysis of uh, that. Uh, Philip, you've certainly put your hands on the key problem when you talk about the um, extractive industries being a source of uh, outflows uh, from Africa. The high-level panel uh, led by Tabo Mbeki focused uh, uh, on extractive industries, realizing that those countries that have large extractive sectors are the countries with the greatest problems of uh, illicit financial outflows. Your, your um, uh, analysis of this was right on. Uh, Brian, I um, uh, will share with you an experience that I had some years ago um, in which um, the comment was made in a meeting that I was in that Uganda was trying to, at that time, consider what uh, um, a policy to follow in its extractive uh, industries, whether to follow the Norway model or the Nigeria model. And I thought to myself, why are you debating this question? Uh, and I do indeed uh, 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 compliment you for focusing on uh, the way that Uganda is uh, ad addressing um, uh, this and I hope that, it, uh, that Uganda will continue to uh, have robust oversight um, of its extractive industry and maximize its contributions uh, to development. Thank you to all of you for your excellent contributions. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Thomas Pogge. Um, it's, uh, it's delightful to, uh, to see the Sen Prize continuing uh, to draw attention around the world. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much Raymond. Um, uh, any, uh, any final comments by uh, any of our presenters? Thomas, if you'd like to add anything before we close it out. Uh, uh, I would have wanted to ask a question to Brian, if I may, but- Sure, uh, yes. Is that possible? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering to what extent the uh, poor ability to cope with the tax uh, avoidance shenanigans by corporations in particular in the case that you outline goes to unwillingness or inability on the part of the authorities, right? One explanation would be they could do much better if they tried, uh, but they get paid off some way under the table uh, to ignore or to, to let it go. And uh, in that context, I would also like to know whether you have an assessment of how things might change if Bobby Wine were to win the elections. <laughs> uh, very interesting question. I uh, thank you so much, Professor Podge. And um, uh, that's very true. The, the, the political framework does inform how uh, tax administration is handled. Uh, specifically in Uganda's oil sector, uh, there have been uh, commentators who've argued that Uganda's aggressive approach of maximum resource extraction has been, uh, in, uh, has been really premised on the current ruling party's desire to use the proceeds of those tax revenues to consolidate their stay in power. Uh, if you know, Uganda has had the same government for uh, over three decades now. So uh, the, the policy of maximum resource extraction, which was really seen in this heritage case, uh, heritage uh, uh, felt the full force of uh, the fury of the Uganda Revenue Authority. Uh, and they were dragged to court, uh, uh, the, the tax authorities, used enforcement mechanisms to try and recover the money uh, by issuing agency notices to Talo Oil, which had um, acquired the interests and threatening not to issue licenses, production licenses and further exploration licenses to Talo. Yeah. Uh, and it's this, po this, th th this policy of maximum resource extraction that the, gov the current government has pursued. And as I noted, uh, some commentators argue that uh, it is 
premised on the current government's desire to use these revenues to consolidate their stay in power. Right now, as we speak, Uganda is going through an election uh, season, and as you rightly noted, the leading candidate is indeed uh, Bobby Wine. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that I, I, I hope that slightly answered uh, your concern about Uganda's uh, policy uh, in administration of taxation, especially, in, and in fact, I would also note that um, uh, when the matter was, when heritage oil and gas uh, took Talo oil uh, to, to court in the UK, uh, disputing uh, Talo's decision, to pay the Uganda Revenue Authority uh, 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 taxes that uh, they would later recover from heritage, uh, the, the Uganda Revenue Authority noted, and specifically uh, Professor Bachibin was brought as an expert witness uh, on behalf of the Uganda Revenue Authority. He noted that Uganda's policy uh, towards the taxation of non-residents is an aggressive policy. Now, it has had its benefits and its uh, challenges, uh, whether the aggression is uh, malafide or bona fide in the interests of all Ugandans. Uh, 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 one point I also would want to note is that, um, uh, whereas there is also the challenge that is brought to tax, that is brought to uh, taxation re regimes by international uh, and multinational corporations, there also remains an internal challenge of, uh, of, of tax administration and tax governance. So uh, dealing with the issue of multinational companies uh, and in this case, international oil companies is just uh, one of the problems. The other problem of internal administration remains. So you don't see a major corruption problem that companies are uh, paying money under the table to uh, officials in the Ugandan government? Um, oh, well, they, 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 there have been instances. Uh, Uganda, just last year, the, the, the boss of the Uganda Revenue Authority was fired uh, during the, uh, the negotiation of uh, production sharing agreements between Uganda and Talo. Uh, something uh, quite outrageous happened uh, uh, the Minister of Energy at that time, who was known as Saida Bumba, signed off uh, a tax exemption, uh, 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 exempting these international oil companies from certain taxes. It was uh, then discovered when the matter was taken to court, the Tax Appeals Tribunal in Uganda determined that uh, uh, the, the Minister of Energy had no such powers. Uh, when she was questioned, she stated that she didn't know what she was doing. There's, there's never been a full trial or a full public inquiry by the, by, 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 by the House of Parliament into such activities. Uh, uh, so corruption hasn't yet been uh, uh, rooted out or it hasn't yet been brought to the light. Maybe that has to do with the fact that the executive omnipotence that characterizes governance in Uganda allows for the government to control and to, uh, to use patronage to control the, uh, the resource sector. So even if there were corruption, it would be very hard for it to surface because the, the, the executive omnipotence is well entrenched and there is patronage of governance in Uganda, political patronage that is. Very good, thank you, uh, Brian. I see uh, Roy Cullen has a question or a comment. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. I, I don't know how appropriate this is, but I, I had a follow-up question based on to, to Brian and also based on Thomas's point. I'm wondering to what extent You'd mentioned, you know, you know the, uh, the company setting up uh, some interest in the Bahamas and, and Mauritius. And I'm wondering to what, and you mentioned some kind, you know, various fiscal arrangements and management agreements. And I'm wondering to what extent 
transfer pricing anomalies crop up in situations like that. I know that typically um, transfer pricing has to be uh, in, in a range of fair market value, but uh, the range of fair market value can be very difficult to, to ascertain. And it could be for management fees, it could be um, for uh, you know concentrate or raw materials and the, the pricing and fair market value. So it's a, it's a simple way or a relatively simple way of moving profits or margins to low tax or no tax jurisdictions. And, um, and I'm wondering uh, to what extent in, um, in uh, Uganda, the tax authorities have the capacities, and it's uh, built to some extent on Tom's point as well earlier, that do they have the capacities really to sift through some of these complex arrangements and, and come to a conclusion that makes sense for the country? Uh, thank you so much, Roy. And uh, indeed, transfer pricing is one of the most notorious uh, artificial profit shifting mechanisms. And um, uh, in the oil sector, it's not as pronounced uh, because of uh, the fact that uh, uh, prices are, are set on market value and it's, it's hard for the, the oil companies do not determine the, the prices, although as you rightly noted, a transfer pricing can happen through uh, various forms, uh, uh, fees, management fees that are inflated and so on and so forth. Uh, but companies are increasingly using more subtle means of artificial profit shifting uh, because uh, transfer pricing has been, um, uh, 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 has been the subject of uh, a lot of rigorous uh, legislation uh, by countries. Uganda has uh, transfer pricing rules, but the, to your point, whether they have the capacity to, 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 to enforce uh, those transfer pricing rules, because transfer pricing in itself is a rigorous process. Uh, I, I would say no, uh, I, there's still a need of development of professional skills for uh, Ugandan professionals, especially tax professionals, because the few tax professionals that are there, for instance, uh, I would note that uh, the, the expert who represented heritage oil and gas, Mr. Festa Sakunovera in the, in, the, in the dispute, in the disputes, is one of Uganda's leading tax, dis, uh, tax lawyers. And these few experts that Uganda has are susceptible to uh, uh, being paid handsomely by the oil companies. And so there's just not enough capacity for the revenue authority. Uh, there's not enough capacity in terms of professional skills uh, for the enforcement of uh, rigorous processes such as transfer pricing. And, and, and I must also add that, uh, uh, that quite certainly there's a lot of uh, abusive transfer pricing that is going on. But because of that very point, the, there is not enough capacity uh, uh, to know and to track it down and to trace it. So a lot of it goes unnoticed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have a question about whether or which website the papers are available on. Thomas, is it on the Global Justice Program website? Uh, we have not made these papers available right now because they are in draft form. We are, of course, happy to do it if all the authors consent to that. But I didn't want to make them available without explicit consent uh, by the writers. And of course, they will now get a lot of feedback from this session also in writing. And so I imagine it would make more sense to make the papers available once they are in their close to final form. Okay, very good. Uh, I will leave it to each of the authors to get in contact with Thomas about whether they want their the papers in their current forms posted not or posted or not, or whether they would prefer to wait until final final edits are made. Uh, any other questions, comments? Not seeing any on the chat. Not seeing any hands raised. I will uh, I will wrap it up then and. Um, thank uh, Amanda Salgado and Natalia Lima for their technical assistance. Um, thank you to 
uh, academic Stand Against Poverty, the Global Justice Program, uh, Thomas Pogge, and of course, all our awardees today, uh, Kenny, Brian, uh, Roy, and Philip. Thank you so much for your effort and your time put into the papers you've submitted. Uh, they really add a lot to um, uh, the uh, knowledge base of what people, researchers, advocates are going to need to refer to around the globe. We see a lot of similarities in uh, problems and similarities in, in solutions, uh, um, statutory regulatory frameworks, uh, judiciaries that work, uh, and of course, transparency in a whole host of financial areas. Uh, before I sign off, we've got one last uh, comments. Okay, very well. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I think we'll end it there. Thank you all again.